Trapped in violence, Afghanistan reels from a wave of attacks. What can be done to restore stability? Also on today's program, a monument to misery. How a statue has reignited anger in South Korea over Japan's wartime sex slavery. And BuzzFeed drops a Donald Trump bombshell without verifying the information. Did the public really need to know? I'm Imran Gata and this is The Newsmakers. A wave of attacks wreaked havoc across Afghanistan on Tuesday in scenes that are repeating themselves all too often. At least 50 people were killed in the latest string of bombings. Among the dead and wounded were members of parliament, intelligence officers and Emirati diplomats. A resurgent Taliban claimed responsibility for two of the attacks. Now for many, it's a sign that security has all but collapsed. And now members of Afghan parliament have said enough is enough. They are planning to summon President Ashraf Ghani to account for why he's failing to keep the country safe. The nation's deteriorating situation has led some foreign forces to consider re-engaging. The U.S. announced plans to deploy 300 Marines to southern Helmand province to train Afghan forces in an area which is almost entirely controlled by the Taliban. The Taliban responded by saying it welcomed the challenge. Today's newsmaker is Afghanistan as we ask who's to blame for the nation's broken security. A double suicide attack near the heart of Afghanistan's capital. The first blast, a suicide bomber targeting parliament staff leaving during the evening rush hour. And then a car bomb exploded, triggered as first responders were treating victims. Dozens were killed and the Taliban claimed responsibility. But this was one in a series of attacks across the country on Tuesday. At least 13 were killed in an explosion at the Kandahar governor's residence, including five United Arab Emirates diplomats. And an attack on a security unit in Helmand province killed at least seven people. International troops ended operations in 2014, when Afghanistan was supposedly on the way to peace and stability. But is this what peace and stability look like? Fifteen years since the Taliban was ousted from power, Afghanistan remains one of the most violent countries in the world. And the Taliban is thought to control more territory now than at any point since its overthrow. Other groups also threaten Afghanistan's security, including Daesh, which has allegedly carried out attacks in Kabul. In the first nine months of last year, the number of civilians killed in attacks was more than two and a half thousand. And of these, nearly 30 per cent were children. More than nine million Afghans are in need of humanitarian aid, and they make up the second largest number of the world's refugees, behind Syrians. When President Ashraf Ghani came to power in 2014, he promised to bring reform, development and security to Afghanistan, seeking peace talks with the Taliban. We, the people of Afghanistan, are willing to speak truth to terror by saying, no, you will never overwhelm us, you will never subdue us, we are going to overcome. Following Tuesday's attacks, the lower house of parliament is looking to summon Ghani to explain why there was what they call a complete breakdown of intelligence. Is Afghanistan's government doing enough to protect its people? And will it be able to deliver on its promise of security? Yvette McCullough, The Newsmakers. Well, joining me now from Kabul is Hekmatullah Azami. He's a research analyst at the Center for Conflict and Peace Studies. Thanks so much for joining us, Mr. Azami. Uh, with so many killed in that spate of attacks, uh, you know, it's, it's, very, it's becoming very, very hard for us to believe that Afghanistan is not in a state of war. Unfortunately, yes, I do agree with uh, uh, that, that Afghanistan these attacks and, and those of the, 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 one, the ones uh, c carried by so many militant groups in the past um, proves that Afghanistan is a conflict zone and is at a state of war. 
So I'm, I'm looking at an interview conducted by President Ashraf Ghani back in March 2016 uh, regarding the refugee trail because there were so many Afghans that are on the refugee trail to Europe and beyond. Massive amount of Afghans. People talk about the Syrians, they talk about the Iraqis, but a lot of the time they, they sort of ignore the amount of Afghans there. And when he was asked by, by the BBC, he was, he was asked if he has any sympathy uh, towards those people. And he said, I have no sympathy for them because, because they should stay behind and help rebuild their own country. With all these attacks throughout the country, do you think the president needs to take back his words now? Because clearly the place is very insecure. Well, my personal, opinion for, my personal opinion for this is, I think uh, I do agree with the president in this regard. Uh, Afghanistan is unstable, there is insecurity, and there is go war going on uh, throughout the country, no doubt. But that does not tell us that we should, um, we should flee the country. They've got, you know, the, you have explosions in the country. Uh, they are killing innocent people. You have the Taliban controlling more territory now than at any point since its overthrow. These are not my words. These are from SIGAR, the U.S. Special Inspector General for Afghanistan. This was in October 2016. So the Taliban controls more territory than it has since it was overthrown. And there's tremendous insecurity in places like Kabul, in places like Helmand, and so on. Don't you have some sympathy for those Afghans who feel, hey, I can't take this anymore because we were supposed to have a stable, safe democracy. That's why we need to leave. I, I think uh, there, there, there might be sympathy, but I think that's not a way, that cannot be a way forward. I think uh, they, better st they better still stay and try hard. I, I, I don't only blame them entirely. I also blame the Afghan government, not that I'm representing the Afghan government here. I don't work for the government. I also blame the government for not creating that, that conducive environment so they can stay, not, not creating all the, those conditions. But I think with them leaving, there will be nothing better. I think instead, if they can stay and contribute in one way or the other, that will, that will lead us to, uh, to somehow a stability. We need right. to work and we need to make things better. Okay, so uh, looking at a way so forward, and, sorry to interrupt you, Hikmatullah. I want to have... I wanna, I wanna jump in here because looking at the way forward, for many years, Afghans and others said the United States and its allies, they need to get out and they need to leave governance to the people of Afghanistan. Now, in the year 2017, might there be a case to say, hey, we need more Americans back in, like those American trainers in the South. We need NATO to come back in in force to help us put a lid on all this insecurity. Is, is that plausible? Is, is that a decent plan, maybe to, to, to ask them for help? Look, Americans, there were 150, over 150,000 uh, uh, NATO troops, but that could not bring, that could not result in s security and stability. I think uh, uh, there's, there, there are two perceptions here. There are two narratives. One is uh, that there's a growing pessimism about the Americans and the NATO troops stationed, and particularly w while they are engaged in Afghanistan. And that is that, okay, whether the, Ameri the, the, the Americans staying in Afghanistan will result in lingering the violence. That's one narrative. The second narrative is, what if they leave? Will the Afghan government be able to survive with the Afghan National Security Forces um, uh, unfortunately unable to provide security? I think uh, there, I, the, the majority of the Afghans do believe that war, in, war is not the way forward to end this conflict which uh, indirectly supports the second narrative. Given, as a final question, I, I want to ask you, given that there was intel beforehand regarding the targeting of parliament, the, tar the targeting of embassies and so on, has this been a failure on behalf of Afghan intelligence? Look, I mean, Th Kabul has been the, the, n the number one target in the favorite target of the Taliban attacks. Uh, there are like so many attempts uh, where the Afghan national security uh, forces and particularly the national intelligence has prevented and uh, foiled uh, attempts against the parliaments and parliamentarians. But then, you know, K Kabul is a huge city. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, 
it, it has so many uh, entrances and it, it, it involves so many actors, including those in the government, that uh, unfortunately we, I, I, ha I personally came across cases where the NDS officials are, are, uh, are supporting or one way or the other helping the militants to hit their targets. So it's not that the intelligence were not aware of the attacks. Like you said, there were warnings. For every attack almost, we have several, uh, several initial warnings and from different sources from within the militants. If a researcher like myself can find out what the Taliban could be looking for uh, or trying to hit, what it's it's a, it's also uh, I mean the, for the intelligence it's quite an easy job to find out because they have intelligence sources they have militants working for them within the militants, but I think it's uh, the matter of uh, uh, commitment lack of commitment within uh, within some sometimes the, the the top leadership of the security institutions uh, that I think uh, they are um, they are not seriously committed uh, to do their job. Unfortunately. Okay. Hekmatullah Azami, it's been good to talk to you. Thank you very much for joining us on the program. It's a World War II wound that won't seem to heal. The Japanese Army's sexual slavery of so-called Korean comfort women has long been a source of contention between the two Asian neighbors. In 2015, they agreed to settle the issue in a deal which was called a final and irreversible resolution. But it's now fast unraveling. It was this statue that reignited the debate, put up outside a Japanese consulate in South Korea. Japan recalled its ambassador, demonstrations spread, and a South Korean monk set himself on fire in protest. The renewed tensions come as South Korea faces its own internal political crisis following the impeachment of President Park Geun-hee. Could this issue become crucial in elections at the end of the year? Natalie Pahernan reports. This golden girl is a symbol of suffering. She represents the young women from the Korean peninsula who were forced to serve as sex slaves or comfort women for the Japanese army during World War II. This statue is the source of an ongoing diplomatic dispute over wartime atrocities, driving Japan to temporarily recall its ambassador to South Korea. When South Korean activists installed this statue outside the Japanese consulate in Busan late last year, they were sending a message to both governments. The activists were not satisfied, with a landmark 2015 apology deal struck over the comfort women issue. It was meant to improve political ties between the two major Asian allies, who had long grappled with how to address Japan's colonial rule of the Korean peninsula. Japan's government promised to pay eight and a half million dollars to care for the surviving comfort women. And on behalf of Japan, Prime Minister Shinzo Abe expressed his most sincere apologies and remorse to all the women who underwent immeasurable and painful experiences as comfort women. Both sides said the issue was finally and irreversibly resolved. But for many South Koreans, and for some of the survivors, the terms of the deal were unacceptable. Creating the divide between the politicians and the people. Both governments say they want to look to the future. Is that realistic when parts of society demand to remember the past? Natalie Pohonen, The Newsmakers. Well, to discuss this, I'm joined by Sung Yung Lee in Medford, Massachusetts. He's the Kim Koo Korea Foundation Professor of Korean Studies at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts University. And from Tokyo, Michael Yon. He's an author and journalist who has served in the U.S. Special Forces and has been outspoken on the issue of comfort women. Gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us. Michael, what is wrong with commemorating and honoring those women who were raped in a very dark period in, in global history? Well, the vast majority of the allegations are completely false. There were a few actual sex slaves, for instance, down in Java. Uh, those were prosecuted mostly by Japanese, um, and, and the rest were prosecuted in about 1946. 
I've researched this myself in 11 countries. It has strategic implications, as you see, uh, just last week, sure. the uh, Japan Ma Michael, recalled hold on for a second. Ambassador. You've researched this on your own for two years, but we're talking of a sort of global historical uh, collective consensus that this happened, and it happened at the scale with, at, at which it was claimed, almost like the Holocaust. I mean, and, and no disrespect to you, but you sound in many ways the equivalent of a Holocaust denier, because then if this didn't happen, right, why did Shinzo Abe apologize? Why did they pay that, that money, which was the equivalent of about nine uh, million dollars then in, in, in 2015. Why did they draw a line in the sand if this didn't happen? Those are good questions, along with the Kono statement as well. I'm certainly not a Holocaust denier. I lived in Europe for six years. There's enough evidence uh, of the Holocaust to, to fill the Astrodome. Uh, that's an absolute uh, fact that that occurred. However, uh, popular evidence is, is not evidence. Uh, mass hysteria, in some cases, there's a, a vast well of hatred for Japanese among some Koreans and Chinese. Professor Lee, Michael says there's a vast well of hatred towards the Japanese. That's where this comes from. It doesn't come from anywhere else. What do you think, Professor Lee? Well, there is strong lingering anti-Japanese sentiment pervasive through China and both Koreas, North Korea and South Korea. And the reason is because Japan's colonial occupation of the Korean Peninsula in the first half of the 20th century was in many ways uniquely cruel and oppressive. Japanese atrocities in China are bigger on just the scale and the gravity of massacres of civilians. Uh, I don't know why we are debating the veracity of the existence of Japanese state-sponsored military brothel sexual slavery more than 25 years after documents in the Japanese Defense Agency Library were unearthed for the world by a Japanese scholar, Professor Yoshimi, which led to the Japanese government's official apology and admission of both direct and indirect involvement in this vast crime against humanity in post-2002 parlance, international world order. So I'm a little puzzled why there is still lingering uh, skepticism by um, some people. Professor Lee, looking within South Korea, might there be an argument that the political vacuum in South Korea is, is sort of being exploited, particularly by the left within South Korea, in order to, to create a fuss out of this right now and to deliberately provoke the Japanese? <clears throat> yes, uh, the political left in South Korea are very good at fanning the flames of anti-Japanese sentiment. Again, it is regrettable, but those sentiments are deeply embedded in Korea, and that is not helpful to Korea-Japan relations and the U.S.-led alliance structure in the region. There is a political power vacuum, chaos in South Korean political landscape right now. It remains to be seen when the next presidential election exactly will take place this year. And the left right now, it's their race to lose because there is such strong disdain and antipathy toward the current president who's been suspended from office, impeached by the parliament. So I think we can expect the left to continue to uh, use, manipulate for political reasons, this presence of skepticism and anti-Japanese sentiment. And in Michael, South Korea. where you are, does Shinzo Abe need to use this and maybe overreact a little bit uh, to appeal to his conservative base over there? Well, I thought it was a mistake to apologize for something that didn't happen. Now, to be clear, uh, Professor Lee is correct. There was an Ianfu system, which means comfort women system. That's well known. Everybody's admitted to that. There's nothing to hide, actually. The United States did the same in Hawaii and other places. Uh, but that was uh, prostitution. Uh, I would like to ask, uh, actually, Professor Lee, as what he thinks about the 2007 IWG final report to Congress. What is that? I'm not aware of it. What, what is it? Because I don't want to go down a rabbit hole here. What is it? Tell me. Well, it's a, a study that cost about the United States taxpayers about $30 million to, to make, and it took uh, about six years to do it. And one of the things that they were looking for specifically 
uh, was evidence of the allegations of sex slavery. They didn't find it. Okay, Professor Lee, Michael's insistent on, on sort of questioning the very premise of all of this. Do you want to have a go at that? There are very few academic or government-sponsored research reports that are perfect. Many imperfections are found in the 9-11 report. That does not mean that 9-11 did not take place. Uh, for the sake of our viewers, I'd just like to mention two or three examples of documented evidence of state-sponsored military sexual slavery. Um, thanks to the Internet, you can all, you know, just uh, check them out on the web. Um, Japanese National Archive under the section Center for Asian Historical Research, file code C04120263400. You'll find documents carrying the telling title of, say, recruitment for recruitment of women for military comfort stations. That would be a document, a military document from March 1938 which states that the armies in the field, the Japanese armies in the field, will fully control the recruit of women in close cooperation with the military police or the local police force in those areas. And there are many others. The chief of staff of China North Area Army in July 1938 wrote that due to the prevalency of Japanese troops behaving very badly, uh, raping local women, setting up, quote, military facilities for sexual comfort is um, of great importance. Then there's a Japanese War Ministry report that outlines how many comfort stations there were in China, Southeast Asia, South Sea, 400, not counting 200 or more in Okinawa, Philippines, Burma. So there is a preponderance of evidence of Japanese government involvement in establishing managing these facilities and coercing women to serve in these hell holes. Okay, that's quite powerfully put, and I'm going to check out those links myself. I hope you do it as, as, as a viewer. Again, nobody has denied that there were comfort women stations. That's a well-known fact. That is a fact, but they were not sex slaves. Okay. They were prostitutes. Uh, uh, we see uh, information war going on. Uh, I call it museum warfare. They're, they're uh, helping to organize museums in various countries. Uh, that, you know, uh, show Japanese atrocities here and there. It's not to say that there was no war crime. Certainly, Japanese committed right. war crimes. There's no question about it. Uh, but whether 200,000 were kidnapped, that's ridiculous. Okay. So China is using this okay. as a part and of its you, program. You made, you made your point, They're Michael. trying to divide up. So, sorry, man. Um, we, we are running out of time. I want to go to Professor Lee for a final comment here. Is this as bad as the 2012 spat, in your opinion, Professor Lee? And might the two countries come out of this okay? with it being just a minor blip? Well, both Japan and South Korea have a common security threat, a common enemy, if you will, in North Korea. And North Korea's nuclear threat has been uh, increasing quite rapidly over the past few years. So I think the bilateral relationship will remain close, but also a little unsteady, tense at times. Things will get worse. And one reason is because the South Korean government, in my humble estimation, really shot itself in the foot by agreeing to these unfavorable terms on December 28, 2015, even declaring that the issue is now final and irreversible. Again, what we're talking about is, in modern parlance, vast crimes against humanity. And such crimes cannot ever be final and irreversible declared by any government. They merit remembering, teaching, commemoration uh, by scholars and students forever. Okay, Professor Lee and Michael Yon, unfortunately, we are out of time. Good to have you on the program. Thanks so much. Okay, it's time to go off script. There's an ancient saying that goes, if you have something to say, ask yourself, is it kind? Is it necessary? Is it true? I like to apply this to journalism. Okay, as for is it kind, there's a lot of stuff out there that needs to be said that isn't exactly kind, so maybe we give that a pass when it comes to journalism. Is it necessary? Now, we seem to be getting better with this. For example, a few years ago when WikiLeaks revealed anything, there was near consensus among us journalists to run their leaks and exposés in totality. But now, most media organizations are selective in what they run from WikiLeaks and what they don't in the name of public safety. 
WikiLeaks was criticized by many in the media for exposing ordinary Saudi citizens to potential danger in 2015. Now, unfortunately, we may have regressed on the last part of the saying. Is it true? Do we have, have at least a, a couple of sources verifying this information beyond a reasonable doubt? Now, BuzzFeed just did an expose of documents from an unnamed intelligence source suggesting that the Russian government has sensitive sexual information about the US president-elect that might be the reason why he is so soft on them. Okay, we all cracked a few puns on social media, me too. It made for some cringing and from, for some chuckling as well. But have you read BuzzFeed's disclaimers? Check this out. Ask yourself, is that acceptable? You read that. Is that acceptable? Or is it that the magnitude of these accusations, that a foreign government has dirt on the president-elect and uses it to blackmail or control him, mean that this information should be out there no matter what? Does necessity trump truthfulness? Or are disclaimers just not enough? Then again, maybe we should blame Trump himself. Here's a guy who, for the best part of eight years, shared and disseminated fake news about Barack Obama's alleged Kenyan birth certificate. Now he's concerned about allegations that don't check out, live by the fraud, die by the fraud. What do you think? Let us know. That's all for this edition of the Newsmakers with me, Imran Garta. Thanks so much for watching. See you tomorrow. Bye-bye.